Welcome to Building Toronto. I'm Peter Sobchak. Let's face it, for decades the city has had a schizophrenic relationship to the waterfront. But not anymore. Because Waterfront Toronto is spearheading a massive revitalization of the shoreline. Of the two main projects currently underway, one will tackle the beleaguered stretch of Queen's Quay Boulevard, while the other will turn a massive and long vacant parcel of land in Bayside into one of the most ambitious neighbourhoods in the city. The inability to connect to the waterfront sort of goes back to the history of the waterfront. It has been a port use, a railway use. It has really hasn't been a, a city use for people uh, for quite some time or, or since the start. Well, we started on the waterfront probably 10 years ago with the Olympic bid uh, for 2008. It was eventually won by Beijing. And that was the genesis of the three government, three orders of government putting in the seed capital to make it happen. So I think you're seeing now, uh, through what we're doing, the revitalization of the waterfront, which is, which is really quite critical. It's not about uh, redeveloping real estate, it's about revitalization, which is about building a great city. So it's about making sure we, we drive sustainability, we build housing for all Canadians, that we're basically promoting transit, we're building a great city, because the real challenge for us is making sure that we're building a city that can be of a world standard, that can attract the best and brightest people that will make us competitive internationally. I think the project I, I'm, I'm most looking forward to is the, the redoing of Queensky Boulevard. That will signal to the world and to Toronto that things really have changed down here. Queensky Boulevard will be Toronto's new signature. Well, Queen's Quay was designed in a different era and really oriented around cars primarily. The sidewalks, for example, are only about four feet wide. There's no bike lanes, no bike trail through this waterfront at all, though it is in the middle of the Martin Goodman Trail, which is one of the most heavily used recreational cycling trails in the city. Uh, from a traffic point of view, there's a lot of illegal activity that happens on the street. It's allowed because we need things like buses to come down here, but they were never really provided for in the original design. Uh, all of those things have really contributed to make it functionally not very good, which you might forgive if it were a beautiful street, but it's also a very unattractive street at this point in time. It has, over the years, really turned into an eyesore and does not have that kind of welcoming quality that the main street to Toronto's waterfront should have. Waterfront Toronto's response to these problems on Queen's Quay was to host an international design competition in 2006. We brought in uh, five of the best uh, design talents from around the world and the winning scheme uh, was selected by an independent jury and is now the basis of the vision for what we're implementing on Queen's Quay. The scheme existed of three layers. The first layer actually is the one who's related towards the water. It's the water edge promenade with the wooden boardwalks. And some parts of that design are already implemented. Just think about the water edge promenade in Bayside, uh, but also here in front of the Queensky Terminal, you've got the wooden boardwalk and, and the promenades. The second layer is uh, the relationship with the water itself, and that's like the finger piers, but also the wave tags. And the wave tags, we've got three of them at this moment. In the future, we will have perhaps even more. You know, Spadina, Reese, and uh, Simcoe wave tag. And then the third layer of that design is Queen's Key, which needs to be a green vein. If as designers you look at the relationship between water and la landscape, there's always a tree there. The group of the seven has, if you just look at Thompson as an, as an artist, he paints beautiful paintings with then rock schemes and, 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 and jack pines on the front. So we took that as a reference and then Queen's Key should be that reference to that image which means that it needs to be a green promenade with a lot of trees and uh, it needs to be a pedestrian zone. The north side sidewalk, it's not a very pleasant space to walk. We want it to be more friendly than what it is today and uh, that includes beautiful paving, beautiful granite unit pavers. Although the size will more or less be the same, we're changing the pavement itself, so the granite paving will be very smooth to walk on by just paving the whole sidewalk in from the roadway all the way to the building facade. Suddenly it's not private anymore, it all feels public. The north side is really where all the retail storefronts are and those have 
had uh, mixed success in the past, partly again because the physical condition of the sidewalk is not ideal. So we are trying to um, not only beautify that north side, but putting in more public garbage cans, better lighting, bike racks, and all of those things that'll make the north side a better place to walk and stroll and shop. And then we've got the road. The road today, we've got two lanes in each direction, and that will change into a road in, uh, which has one lane in each direction, but with dedicated right-hand turns. That's the biggest difference with what it is there today. Despite taking two lanes of cars away, we're going to have a better functioning road. The problem isn't that there's only two lanes or four lanes. The problem is one guy's trying to make a right turn, and everyone else has to wait for him to make that turn before they can go. So we are going to be solving that congestion problem largely, and I think we're going to have a street, from a car point of view, is actually better. The traffic will flow in a very gentle and easy way, and that's a big improvement for Kwinski itself. South of the road, everything is elevated. That means that everything is about 15 centimeters higher. In that way, we're creating a pedestrian-friendly zone. Transit, obviously, is a key piece of bringing people to the waterfront, and we very much want to improve the public transit system to the degree that we can. The streetcar tracks here now are at the end of their useful life and needed to be replaced, so the timing is great. We're going to rebuild the street and all of the beautiful streetscape elements and upgrade the TTC itself. It right now has substandard width platforms that are not wheelchair accessible uh, and really don't leave nearly enough space for the volumes of people who use this streetcar. So we'll be widening those to full standard width. We'll be putting in modern shelters so people can wait. It gets cold and windy down here in the winter. You want to be able to wait in a shelter. They will feel very welcome at the waterfront because they have a wider platform to step in and out of the, the streetcar, including uh, the street furniture that is on uh, the platform makes it uh, a good place to arrive at the waterfront. We're also creating a true pedestrian esplanade on the street by taking away two lanes of traffic that are on the south side of the TTC right-of-way that you see behind me and converting them into a granite mosaic sidewalk. The promenade is about 13 and a half meters wide and that's really where the pedestrian will feel welcome and it will be the, the zone where people will walk and hang out and um, talk with each other but also walk from uh, east to the west side of uh, the waterfront. The zone will be paved in with beautiful granite uh, paving which is like 10 by 10 centimeters, dark red, but there will also be a motive in it. We call it a mosaic. And the mosaics ex exist of the maple leaf, but then the outlines of the leaf itself, and that will be in a white stone. Uh, one of the main components is to create, finally, a dedicated cycling trail through here to serve the very growing numbers of cyclists that ride not only in Toronto, but especially want to come down to the waterfront. We're making a connection in the Martin Goodman Trail, and that means that we're connecting the existing trail in the east and the west together through Central Waterfront. The vision that we gave for the waterfront in uh, 2006 promised a double row of trees south of the TTC right away, so on the promenade. What you're seeing in typical street trees here in Toronto is that they're only surviving for seven to 10 years, and that has to do with the compacted soil beneath uh, paving. So what we're doing is we're investing a lot of energy and a lot of money below grade just to make sure that those trees will survive and will have a lifespan of 25 to 50 years old. So at that moment you have a tree that is at 12 to 15 meters high. And we're planting trees that have that kind of a lifespan so they will get to be big and robust and create a kind of civic scale uh, that's really lacking on the street now. If you just walk today the stretch of Kunski and you walk along the street, then you have almost no place to hide during the summer because the sun is shining very hard on the street. Well, in the future, if you have a double row of trees in, on the south side, but also the trees on the north side, you're at least possible to walk in the shade of the trees. And then the trees are very typical for this climate. It has a big leaf, but light, so it's always very light and beautiful to walk underneath it. It has a very strong character also in the winter. Reducing the space for cars, giving more space to the pedestrian, adding trees will also during winter season make it a more comfortable zone to walk in. The design is looking at the different aspects of seasonality in the street and, and I think if you walk along the stretch you will also see that in just how the tree is blossoming, changing colors in the leaves but also how flowers will pop up and, and give color to the streets. So we only have about 27, 28 meters to work with, and everybody wants a piece of it. I think we now have a plan that has very, very broad public support. If you look at the street today, 
um, I've got two sidewalks, one on the north side and one on the south side, and they have an average dimension of about two and a half meters wide. It's not a very generous, generous space to walk as a pedestrian. So one of the huge things that we're promising with the vision is that on the south side we give you about 30 meters of pedestrian friendly zone. I think we will have a street which will be very comfortable to walk on but will also be very pleasant to be there and, and to take your children and your stroller with you and just walk the whole stretch from Spadina all the way to Parliament. Once you seed something in that neighborhood it, and that seed starts to grow, it will blossom. Just as a reference, if Green Ski will be beautiful again, then you will see that neighborhoods around the street will also start to blossom. Uh, stores will reopen along Queen's Key, so the frontage and the life at Queen's Key will blossom again. Once all the infrastructure is moved, then we will start the rebuild of the surface works, starting with the rebuild of the road on the north side. Along with the TTC, those two things will be done in parallel, so we'll have transit and cars back up and running. And then we'll be free on the south side to build the pedestrian promenade and the Martin Goodman Recreational Cycling Trail and the Double Alley of Trees and the Granite Mosaic, um, all in time for the 2015 Pan Am Games. And that will cover about 1.5 kilometers from approximately Spadina to Bay Street. It was seen as one of the worst, uh, ugliest streets in the world by a New York spacing blog a couple of years ago. And we're going to turn it into one of the most beautiful streets in the world. When people come to Toronto, they will want to walk Queen's Quay. You go to Paris, you walk the Champs-Élysées, you go to Barcelona, you walk the Ramblas. When you come to Toronto in five years' time, you'll have to walk Queen's Key Boulevard. It'll be that stunning. We don't want cookie-cutter building one after the other. We, we really want each of the buildings to be different. And Toronto's waterfront really is one of the largest urban revitalization projects in North America, if not the world. And it's really important to know that revitalization is quite different from redevelopment. Revitalization is all about being driven by a sort of social policy to create great public realm, to drive sustainability, housing for all Canadians, promote transit. It's really an effort to create a new kind of city, one that will attract the best and brightest people because we have the highest quality of place and quality of life to make us economically competitive on a world scale in the long term. This whole entire part of the city has really been abandoned and really underutilized for years. If you think of the waterfront in Toronto, you think of all these towers behind me, it's a wall of towers, one after the other, really blocking Toronto residents from their waterfront. Waterfront Toronto held a bunch of meetings with stakeholders, people that live here, that work around here, to really ask what do they want to see on the waterfront. And what came out of that vision is really a neighborhood that's livable. Unlike most development, we actually build the public ground first and then add the developers later. It actually helps three ways. It convinces the public it's actually happening this time. You know, sets a high standard for developers who will take that and basically build great buildings beside great parks. And lastly, if our business model is to sell the land next door to garner profits to reinvest, then it adds value to the land for us as well. So it's a different model, but it's working very well for us. Well, Sherburn Commons came out of a park for the whole of the East Bayfront precinct and in fact it was always conceived as wanting to be a central open space for that precinct during that planning and it's managed to hold on to uh, not only its geographic location within the precinct but I think in terms of its program it ultimately is going to deliver what the uh, entire neighborhood of East Bayfront is going to need. So it's going to be not only the crossroads of how people move to the water and to the city, but it's also going to be the crossroads of people moving east and west. And the idea really is that there's going to be all sorts of recreational opportunities that house themselves in, in Sherman Common. We had to think about the park uh, on a number of different levels. So it needed to deliver something for children, obviously, and so you'll find that children actually enjoy the full breadth of the park. There's a children's play area on the north side that is just as interesting to adults as it is to children. But it was located there because there's going to be more of a recreational focus on the development that's going to happen on the north side of Queen's Key. 
this side of the park had to be able to deliver program that would be able to facilitate larger groups, a more robust crowd, if you will, so there's a, a large play field. In the middle, we have a splash pad, which in the summertime is enjoyable for not only children, but I've seen businessmen taking off their shoes and socks and walking through the splash pad in the summer. In the wintertime, it becomes a skating rink, and it's actually full of people down here uh, enjoying a skate. East Bayfront has this need to sort of connect itself east-west. And so you've got the Promenade, you've got the Queen's Quay, you've got Lake Shore, and there's going to be a couple of uh, interstitial connections that move people east-west, whether they're going for shopping, whether they're going for school. The park actually situates itself right in the middle of that, that's at, at, at the nexus. What was really important to us to add to that was to connect north-south. The connection between the city and the lake has been disconnected because of the way development has occurred. We felt that we wanted to stretch that open space from the lake as far as we could, and so this long uh, linear park really connects the lake to Lakeshore and beyond. So Waterfront Toronto went out to the market looking for one private group to really bring their vision to the whole site. They assembled a 13-acre site that they consider their crown jewel. It is arguably, in their minds as well as ours, the best site in the city of Toronto. On the water, five minutes away from Union Station, they went out uh, to an international competition. 17 proponents responded from Australia to Toronto, and we were selected as part of the process. And we proposed a plan that includes roughly two million square feet of space in total. About half a million square feet of that is office space. Uh, there's going to be about 1,700 residential units, about 150,000 square feet of retail, and then cultural venues as well, as well as parks, uh, recreation space. The intent is to create a vibrant, energetic neighborhood. East Bayfront is a mixed-use community. There's going to be people living and working here, and with George Brown College, there's going to be people studying here and recreating. The challenge is to bring all those multiple uses in a way that benefits each of the uses. Here we have to think about what uses do we bring on first? Do we do residences, office, parks? Uh, and how much of each use do we do, and when? How, you know, how do we stagger these uses? We're going to start with a residential building and hopefully very soon thereafter an office building. And the intent right at the beginning is to create enough critical mass that we create a community, that people don't feel like they're part of a construction site. So that phase one needs to have enough momentum and critical mass to feel like it's a whole and not something you need to live through for a long time. One of the most important features in a master plan like this is the overall vision, not just of the individual buildings, but of how they fit together. So probably the most critical element is the fabric between the buildings, more so than each individual building, is what happens between them, how do you bring them together. So the ground floor is critical, that's really what unites all these buildings. So that's where the vision started, with the master plan of where we want to end up, and then you go to individual architects in the Waterfront Toronto and Hines were very aligned in bringing world-class talent. So the architect for the first residential phase was selected through a design competition. We, we didn't ask architects to come and tell us about themselves. We said, come look at the site, look at its challenges and its strengths. Come tell us what you would do with the site. And we selected some of the best architects to come to this competition, ultimately selected Architectonica, who we think is probably one of the preeminent design architects for residential in the world and we selected Cesar Pelli to be our architect for the first office building. But the vision really isn't to apply these two designers throughout, and we hope to bring in new and different architects to each of the buildings. We've had to create design guidelines as part of the whole Waterfront Toronto and City submission process, but at the same time, we want to give each of these architects as much leeway as possible to really bring in a different vision. We don't want cookie-cutter building one after the other. We, we really want each of the buildings to be different. The buildings are gonna be shorter, um, really again to create that sense of neighborhood. They're not going to be a series of high rises, but part of the vision was more of a livable, transparent community that people can see right through. So people going along Queens Quay can look right through these buildings and see, look right at the water. One of the considerations when you design on the waterfront is dealing with the weather in Toronto. How do you protect people outside from wind? And our solution for that was really based on old-fashioned techniques they use in Europe and have used for centuries, which is using the massing of buildings. So you don't have these big corridors. We created small streets and breaking down these streets with buildings so you don't have major avenues and big wind tunnels whooshing through these buildings.
this was the perfect location to begin to think about how stormwater from the community could ultimately be a part of a system. Toronto's waterfront is probably the largest urban revitalization pr uh, project in North America. So sustainability is a core value of that. And I think we're building uh, sustainability in everything we do. We established a sustainability framework in 2005 that established how we build things, what we build. And so we're able to really project it into all our planning and all our, our specifications to make sure, in fact, that we're building a very sustainable environment. But because we have control of land, we can say to developers, if you want to build with us, that's great. But guess what? It has to be lead gold, or it has to have uh, meet our minimum green building requirements. So we're able to build into the development requirements a lot of the green standards that are really, really important for us going forward. For example, we're now specifying that we have to have structural flexibility. So while today's marketplace are to build very small condos with sheer wall construction, that's pretty, pretty limiting. So what we're saying in the future is, no, you have to build your structure so that it has tall ceilings, to sustain future markets. It has the flexibility to allow units to be reconfigured over time. So you're not building a condo for 50 or 60 years, you're actually building a structure that can last for hundreds of years. We see ourselves not just trying to build green buildings, but it's important for us to be really the agents of market transformation. If we control land for 40,000 residential units and 10 million square feet of office space, then it's really incumbent on us to help drive that agenda and help change the marketplace. So the stormwater treatment plan actually came out of the original East Bay Bayfront precinct plan. We worked on it with an architectural group out of Boston back in 2003. And at that point in time, conceptually, we were thinking, well, with the way that cities are moving towards uh, more sustainable ideas, what if we took a, a neighborhood-wide approach, uh, an area-wide approach, and collected all of the stormwater that was going to come into this neighborhood and somehow do something with it? And at that point in time, that idea was embedded in the plan, but then it was left. Ultimately, when we came back into Sherburne Common as a separate project, we felt that uh, this was the perfect location to begin to think about how stormwater from the community could ultimately be a part of a system, if you will, that the park could deliver. The idea here is that once the community is all built up, all of the stormwater from the, the roads and the buildings are going to be collected. They will move by gravity to a cistern collection system underneath a boardwalk expansion along the promenade. Eventually, the waters will filter out the sediments it moves over to where Parliament Slip is going to be redeveloped and ultimately comes to the basement of this pavilion where there is probably the highest technology UV water treatment system embedded in the basement of this building. From there, it cleans out all of the impurities and moves through up into the north side of the park through those very, very beautiful sculptures that Joanne will create it and ultimately move back to the lake. And the interesting thing about this, by the time it gets to the lake, the water is 99% pure. The big sustainability feature is, in fact, the, the genesis of the park. It's the stormwater idea, and it's done at such a scale that the impact, I think, the benefit of, of that particular move is pretty enormous, particularly when you realize that it's a sustainability move that is serving this entire East Bay Front neighborhood. You know, sustainability is not just environmental, it's social as well, and it seems to me that once the community has bracketed this park and really built up and you imagine several thousand people living here and several thousand people going to school here, etc. that sustainability uh, within a social context uh, becomes quite real in this park, that it is going to become an open space that allows the community to breathe and have fun. I, I think you know you've got a successful waterfront when you see it's animated. People are down there, you can sort of count the smiles as one of the metrics. People want to go there, They'll want to have ca coffee there in the cafes and so forth. It'll be a place you want to come and experience, both as a resident of Toronto as well as a tourist. Across Toronto's waterfront, there is a remarkable transformation taking place. A transformation to more sustainable, accessible and useful public places. 
Our waterfront is shedding its old industrial past and making way for a brighter future that focuses on being more open, attractive, and economically viable. I'm Peter Sobchak. Join me next time on Building Toronto.